Um, so in any event, I, I did want to kind of walk you through this, but I really, I can't overemphasize. I'm still having this problem where it's dangling off the left side of the screen. It's, cool. it's, the, it's the AV setup. They make you go RGB. It's, it's a well, yeah, but the annoying thing is that part of what I'm going to show you is going to be dangling off the left side of the screen. Um, but, okay, we'll, we'll make do. Um, so, again, I, I can't um, emphasize enough that really the name of the game here is just messing around with this and learning from your mistakes. And there's also a ton of stuff available on the Internet. So I routinely learn things about, like, I've used this tool every day, day in and day out for, like, the last 20 years. And, like, I still learn stuff, and almost every day. And I just do that by Googling, and, like, you're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. That's kind of a neat trick. I'll add that to my bag of tricks, right? And then that's, that's kind of how you get good at it. So let me start by running it. Uh, obviously, I'm running this off a of Mac. If you're running this off a of PC, it basically works exactly the same way. Um, so you'll forgive me if this is all familiar to you, but um, I'm going to try to give you like at least a uh, like a kind of a 10 minute introduction. Let me see if I can. There we go. All right. So and everyone can see my cursor. Good. So there's. Um, let me just really quickly select the uh, the default layout. Okay, so when you start MATLAB, you may or may not get something that looks like this. And what you can see is that there's a bunch of windows in what's called the, um, uh, it's like an integrated development environment. So there's a lot of different windows, and um, probably the first thing that you should know is that you can reconfigure all of them. So depending what you want to see and how you want to see it, you can kind of retool this window. Um, it's like infinitely customizable. But let me show you what we're currently looking at. Um, probably the first thing you should see is the current folder. So you're always in a current folder, and whatever folder you're in, like if you tell it to look for a file, it's going to look for the file in whatever the current folder is. So if, you're, if you don't change your directory to whatever the current folder is, and you tell it to look for a file and it's not in that folder, it's going to give you an error. Unless you specifically like tell it, oh, you've got to go to this directory, this subdirectory, this subdirectory, and then you'll find that file. So first thing you have to do is, um, set the current folder. And you can do that in a couple ways. You can either, there's a pull down menu where you can get all your previous folders, or if you hit these, uh, these little three dots right here, you can just browse. Okay, so if you're, um, you know, if you're working on an assignment, um, you know, so let's say um, lecture three. Okay, so that would be today's folder, let's say. So I could now change my directory to lecture three. And there you go. So now on this window, this window is the current folder window. It shows you all the files that are in the current folder. Guess what? There are no files in the current folder. Um, that's because we just created it. That's why it's empty. Um, so here's your windows. You have the current folder. This gives you a list of everything that's in the current folder. You have a command window. That's where you type commands. You know, x equals 3, y equals 4, um, z equals x plus Oops, x plus y, you get 7. Okay, so you can, it's just an interpreter. You type commands in, it interprets the commands on the spot. Okay, let's look at the right-hand side. I've got two more windows here. This one is called Workspace. Workspace gives you a list of all your variables that are currently in memory. Well, look what I've done. I've just defined three variables, x, y, and z. So look, it's telling you, hey, in memory, you've got three variables, and they're called x, y, and z. Um, it tells you the value of each one. Um, and if it's an array, it'll also tell you the minimum and maximum value in that array. So we'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes about what goes in, um, like what kind of variables you can have. Uh, you can also plot directly from the workspace. There's a lot of options you can do. But I don't want to get too, too into it too quickly. Down here, you have a command window. It looks like it's giving me a history of all the commands that I've typed. So if you, you know, it's, it's awesome. I mean, I've got like weeks and weeks worth of old commands here. So if you ever forget what you did, you know, it's MATLAB's got your back. All right. So one thing that's really awesome about this is that you can reconfigure this. So let's say that I don't really care to see what's in the current folder and it's distracting me. So if you look at the top here, you look at all the little icons that you have. There's an X, um, an, an undock arrow, a minimize, and then a maximize. So, and all of, all of your windows have the same feature. So for example, if I just click X, the current folder window will just be gone. 
I can get it back. It's in one of the pull-down menus, but it'll just remove it altogether. I can undock it, in which it pops out and becomes its own window, which is sometimes handy. Um, let's see, how do I pop that back in? Uh, window, where did it go? Desk. Dock it back in. I can minimize it. If I minimize it, it's not deleted, it's still there. It's just got a little, you know, it's got a little tag on the side, so you can kind of call it up. Just, you know, if you just want to take a quick peek and then get it out of your way, you can do that. Uh, if I want to bring it back, I just uh, redock it. And then, you know, you can maximize it so it takes up the whole screen. So you got a lot of options. All your windows work the same way. Suppose for whatever reason you're anal retentive and you don't like your command history window there. You can just drag it over here. Okay, or you can drag it in the middle, right? Whatever you want. All your windows can be dragged around, right? You can combine these two windows. Um, how do you come? Hold on. Oh, right, so now I've got command history, command window. So the, you know, you say you want to put it down here. Whatever you want. So all these windows are customizable. Um, and MATLAB kind of comes with a bunch of uh, layouts that are pre-saved. So like there's the default window. Um, Let me just make sure I get that lined up. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you have some other mechanism that you like, you can, um, you can tweak it the way you like and then save your desktop layout. And then that way you can always get it back the way you like it. Okay, there's two more windows that are vital that are not shown in this setup. Uh, one is the editor, which it's stuck over here. And I don't like to where it stuck it, so I'll, I'll change that in a minute. And the other is the figure window. How do you get the... I, you can do it a bunch of ways. Uh, let me just delete it and start over. Oops. I mean, I could have... In this case, I just typed edit, which is a command to say, I want to edit a file. And it saw that there was no editor open, so it opened the editor. <laughs> but if I come to... Um, if I come to my desktop tab, up, uh, my desktop menu, I can just select editor, and it does the same thing. And ditto for the figure window. That's the other one. Oh, what a cluttered workspace I have. This is no fun. You're late, sir. Um, OK, so let's, um, I don't know, let's see. Yes? Yeah? Yeah, that'll do the same thing. That would have opened the editor as well. Um, OK, so what, a, what an awful cluttered mess I have here, right? I've got, I've got more stuff that I need. Uh, so let me think about how I want to change this. I'm going to start by parking the current folder on the side. Uh, I'm going to drag this over to make my editor a little bigger. And um, let's see. Actually, one thing I like to do, I like to put the, put the command window under the editor. So I only need like a couple lines on the command window. I've got a nice big editor. And uh, I personally don't care for the command history, so I'm going to delete that. And um, Oh, let's see. I think for now we'll just put the workspace down here. OK, so now I've got an editor window. And I can either type my commands in in the command window one by one. And that's fine. I can do that. The disadvantage of doing that is if you quit and come back tomorrow, you've got to retype all those commands in again, which kind of sucks. right? So instead, what you're going to do is you're going to type your commands in the editor. So x equals 3 y equals 4, z equals x plus y. And then you save the file. So I just hit the, um, you know, you can just hit the save button like, like anything else. And within lecture three, uh, I can say my file. And that's it. So now if I look in current folder, hey, there's a file there. And it's called myfile.m. I didn't specify the .m. MATLAB just slapped that on there for me. .m is what MATLAB calls um, it's a script file or a function file. It's basically just, it's a text file. You could edit an M file using any text editor you want. It's just a text file. But that's what MATLAB calls it, a .m file. OK, so, um, so now I can, um, I can see this uh, green arrow here? Look what that says, save and run my file .m. You click it, it runs your file. OK? So. A couple things that every M file should have, every script should have. You should always start with the clear command. Clear wipes all the variables out of memory. 
So this isn't strictly necessary, but it's a good programming style. If you don't clear out of memory before you start, you may have old variables from before and just forgot you had them. And um, you may wind up operating on some variable that you had, you know, like old data or something, old ass data, if you like. Um, so you, instead, you know, you just clear it and you know you're starting with a clean slate. Uh, any guess what the semicolon does for you? I've got two lines with a semicolon and one line without a semicolon. Yes? So it doesn't return anything? Yeah, that's right. If you look at, um, if I take all my semicolons off and I run this file, Look what happens in the command window. For every single command that it executes, it tells me not only does it assign x equals 3, but it returns that information to the command window so that I know that x now equals 3, which is kind of handy. I mean, sometimes you want to know what your variables equal, but if you've got 1,000 lines of code, you don't want each line of code telling you what it did, especially when what that line of code does could be returning a matrix with a million points in it. Right? That's just, you don't need to be seeing a million points scroll across your screen. So typically, we put uh, semicolons um, at the end uh, just to suppress the output. It's still, the line still gets executed. I mean, x and y and z still get assigned. It's just that it doesn't, it doesn't rep repeat that information in your command window. Um, oh, look at this. This is kind of fun. You see this little orange box here? I'm going to highlight over that box. I just, I'm just going to mouse over it. Warnings found. So it's trying to debug my code for me. Warnings found. Let's see what the warning is. Oh, look, right here. See this little line? This is where the warning is. Line five. Terminate st statement with semicolon to suppress output. Fix. It put a semicolon for me. I don't need it there. It's just a warning. Maybe I do want to have Z be, be printed to the screen. It's just telling me. Sometimes, um, instead of a warning, it could give you an error. Uh, nope, that's a warning. Um, let's see how we can generate a warning. What's that? Y equal. Uh, let's see. No, that won't give me an error. No, you can do that. <laughs> MATLAB's actually pretty. Pr What's that? y equals, oh, actually, let's do this. Here, here's, um, That's an error. there we go. There's an error. There we go. That was easier than I thought. y equals, y equals what? Hey, now instead of an orange box, I got a red box. Warnings found. Line four, parse error at end of line. Usage might be invalid MATLAB syntax. I mean, it's doing its best to help you out, but at least it told you where the error was, okay? So, all right, invalid syntax. Oh, well, you know what the invalid syntax is? I didn't tell it what y equals. Now I'm good to go. All right, you save it, you run it, you're off to the races. OK, so forget x and y and z. Let's, um, let's actually plot something. So this is essentially the same plot we did, um, we did on Wednesday. So we, we had a 4 hertz cosine. Is that right? Mm -hmm. OK. So I don't have to do it this way, but I mean, let's just do this kind of for fun and, and learning. So f equals 4. Now, I'm going to put a little percent sign here, and it turned green. Any guess what the percent sign is going to do for me? It's a comment. OK. Hertz. So now I remember, for what, right? I mean, maybe the, the, the variable name f isn't clever enough to tell me, remind me what, what I was talking about. OK, it's 4 hertz. I get it. Now I need a time vector. How long do we run our time vector for? It was two seconds, right? Four hertz, that should give me eight repetitions of my cosine. So t equals, so again, a couple ways of doing this. I'm going to run the linspace command. That's a built-in command to MATLAB. Uh, it's basically going to give me an array of numbers, uh, evenly spaced. So I'm going to say, please start an array of numbers at, at zero. I want you to end at two seconds. And I would like for you to have 1,000 points, which is a number I'm going to pick out of a hat. So it's going to give me 1,000 numbers evenly spaced between 0 and 2. And finally, I'm going to say x equals cosine 2 pi f t. You've got to put the little asterisk. So that means times. Like You can't just put 2 pi f t without timesing it. It won't know what you're talking about. Uh, pi is a built-in number. Pretty sweet. right? You don't have to say pi equals 3.14. It just knows. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to run that. And before we plot anything, we're going to look in my workspace. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, what we've just accomplished. So I've got three variables. Here's f. That's nice. It's got one value. That value is 4. So there's not much exciting going on there. Now let's look at t. t is a matrix. Ever wonder why they call it MATLAB? The MAT stands for matrix. So it's basically designed to operate on matrices. So what are the dimensions of this matrix? One, one row, a thousand columns. OK. So if I were to double click on T here in the workspace, it's going to open up yet another window that we haven't seen yet called the variable editor. And here it actually shows me the actual values in that matrix. What's the first element of T? Zero. Why? Because I told it, right? <laughs> That's what I wanted. OK, now I could scroll through this. I could edit them. I could change them if I want. It's just like having an Excel spreadsheet. And if I scroll all the way to the 1,000th element, I mean, I know you know what we're going to see, but you know, there we go. The 1,000th element is 2. Excellent. How do you get this screen for electronics? Uh, to get that screen, I double clicked on T in the workspace. And that brought up, oops, um, that brought up the variable editor. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, it's always rows, comma, columns. So what, what happens if you insert that and make it 100 times? Eh, nothing, nothing would change. It, everything I'm going to show you would still work. <laughs> OK. So now we want to run the plot command. So all I have to do is say plot t, comma, x. And run it. So there's my figure. So, uh oh, OK. So I'm going to dock that figure. I'm going to click the little dock so it docks it in the figure uh, thingy over here so I can have all my windows in one screen. And hey, that looks pretty good, right? So, um, so I like that. I got my eight periods. Let's see, here's one period, two, three, four. Oh, four periods in one second. Cha-ching. OK, five, six, seven, eight periods. That's predicted. OK? Couldn't be any easier. You put more commands in there if you want. Um, let's, make a, let's make a Y command. Let's make a Y, which is a shifted cosine. How much did we shift the cosine the other day? I don't remember. Minus pi over 3? OK. So two cosines. See what I did? I defined another cosine, which I called y. And then in the plot command, instead of just plotting t comma x, I plotted t comma x and t comma y. Hey, what if I have a small brain and I can't keep them straight? Legend, no shift, shift. A little legend. OK, and you're off to the races. So I'm just showing you a handful of things just to kind of get you familiar with how to do this. There's more than one way to do this. Like um, there are, uh, for example, I could have plotted directly from the workspace. I could have come here and selected, just highlighted T and X. And look, oh, there's a little button here that says plot. You can just click that and it'll plot them for you. Right? Or I think I could have uh, highlighted T and X and Y. Uh, that didn't work. Oh, yeah, I got confused about T. Anyway. My preference, I, this is my personal preference, I just like to run things out of the command window. But, you know, different strokes for different folks. This is what I'm saying. The only way you're going to learn this stuff is to mess around with it yourself, Google it. If you get that book that I was telling you about, the, um, the Intro to MATLAB book, there's a lot of good tips in there. Um, just find kind of a, a workflow that works for you. You ask people, you ask your friends, like you ask me. Um, Sooner or later, you kind of get comfortable with, with how to do it. And as we go through the semester, like, I'll be posting more code and showing you how to do more stuff, and hopefully you'll, you'll pick it up as you go along. All right, questions? So I'll post this to Blackboard. Um, 
I'll give it a better name than myfile.m, though. Um, let's see, what should we call it? So generic. How about basic plot? Okay, that way I can keep them straight. Because otherwise, I'm going to have like 40 files in my directory called you know, intro one, intro two, so on and so forth. All right, so we good on MATLAB for now? So that's just to get us started. What is MATLAB book that you mentioned? I'm sorry? The MATLAB book that you uh, It's in our syllabus, um, which everybody has. If you go to, if I go to where? If you go to our intro handout, which uh, I posted on Blackboard for everyone to read, uh, it says it right here, getting started with MATLAB 7. Uh, I knew you can buy it for 30 bucks. I mean, if you're willing to get a used copy, you could probably get it for under 10. Yeah. I mean, at eight bucks, it's like, it's basically free. It's really, it's just lunch money. All right. So, um, so we're going to hold off on uh, doing more MATLAB for now, but that should hopefully be enough to kind of uh, get us moving. So I do want to kind of get back to some, uh, some more cosines because uh, we're going to get very comfortable playing with cosines. And uh, we're going to start by finding out if everybody remembers their complex numbers. That's sort of the, uh, oh, I guess I can turn that off. All right, let's see here. OK, so. Um, so where we left things on Wednesday was we decided that your generic your generic cosine has um, can be written like this. We said um, again, I'm just going to be consistent with I'm going to change the variable just a touch so I'm consistent with the book. Uh, x of t equals k cosine omega t plus phase, all right? And just to summarize, we said that omega is 2 pi f, which is also the same thing as 2 pi over the period. So we got rads per second, hertz, and seconds on the units. The units of phi was radians and that radians tells us what the shift is if phi has a negative value so if phi is less than zero do we shift to the right or the left remember if phi is negative that means it'll be omega t minus some number which is a shift to the right so that's a right shift and conversely if phi is uh, greater than zero, that's a left shift. Good. What's the units of K? Good. Unitless. Can you guys read this, or is this uh, getting eaten by the podium? It's getting eaten by the Okay, I won't write there anymore. Um, so K is unitless. It doesn't have any units. Um, and remember, we talked about uh, how do we convert, how do we calculate the time, the, the, the number of seconds that it shifted by? You take phi and divide it by omega, right? So it's T shift equals phi divided by omega. And that made sense because that's rads divided by rads per second should just give you a right shift in seconds. Okay, so that's our basics. Good. So and we did some plotting on that and hopefully all that made made uh, some sense. Alright, um, so now we get to the all-important uh, Euler's formula. So to some extent the conversation that we're going to be having is going to parallel uh, what you talked about in circuits 2 a little bit when you talked about Laplace transforms. Uh, in fact, everything we're going to talk about is, is pretty related, but we're going to be attacking it from a totally different angle for a totally different purpose. Uh, I think when you learned about uh, Laplace transforms, it was more for like as a tool for solving differential equations. Here it's more as uh, like 
a concept of information theory. Um, so you are going to see some parallels. All right, so Euler's formula states E to the J, do I use phi or theta in the book? I use theta. E to the J theta equals cosine theta plus J sine theta. What? Okay, so things just got ugly. Everybody remember their complex numbers? Okay, so for example, uh, suppose I came to you with um, 2 plus 3j. Complex number, right? It's got a real part, it's got an imaginary part. If I were to plot it, I draw a set of axes, I say, look, I've got a real axis, I've got an imaginary axis. I'm going to go two units over on the real axis, I'm going to go three units up on the imaginary axis, I'm going, to, I'm going to drop a dot there, I'm good. If I'm thinking about things from a vector perspective, I can draw a little arrow to that dot, but let's not get too caught up in details. Okay. Is that number in rectangular form or polar form? Rectangular form. Good. How do we convert it to polar form? We've got to get the magnitude and the phase. Hold, let me just think for a second. Do you remember the, on Wednesday when I was showing you those plots? How many plots did I say we needed? Magnitude. Always. Two. Two plots. Magnitude and phase. Why are we using complex numbers? It's got two pieces, right? Technically, it's one number. It's one complex number. It's just got two pieces. So everything we're about to do is kind of like this engineer's sleight of hand to half the amount of work that we would otherwise have to do, right? We know we need two plots, right? Because that's, that's how we have to think about signals when we want to think of them in the frequency domain, OK? But it's not very, it's the least clean way to do it is to think of it as one formula for magnitude and one formula for phase. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the sleight of hand where we mush them both together into a complex number, one complex number, which can be described by one formula. And yet, that one formula contains magnitude and phase. So we, like, we, take, we bake, take both of those and, and, and condense them into like one unit that we have to keep track of. It's really rather elegant, and I think you're going to see that more and more as you move forward. Having said that, let's convert this to polar form. There we go. So magnitude is going to be, it's all, what's, so the formula is, you take the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, and you take the square root of that, right? So in this case, it's going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. So that's 4 and 9 is, 4 and 9 is 13. Great, couldn't pick a clean one, could I? Uh, so you get root 13. Let's see. We know root 16 is 4, so it's less than 4. It's more than 3. Uh, I don't know. 3 and a half, 3 and a quarter. Seriously, one of you got a calculator? It's like 4 million iPhones in here. <laughs> and graphic calculators and bat watches. Can somebody take the root of 13? Help a guy out. We'll take 3.6. That's good. OK. So in other words, what does that 3.6 mean? That means that if I were to draw a line from here to here and measure it, it would be 3.6 units long. OK, we're halfway there. What if we want to get the phase? <coughs> Inverse tan of the imaginary part over real part. Because basically what we're doing is we're trying to find this angle. Right? And to find that angle, we're going to take the inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent. And the opposite happens to be the imaginary portion, and the adjacent happens to be the real portion. So we're taking the inverse tangent of, what is it, 3 halves. Set your calculator to radians. I will beat you with a dry erase marker. 
if you even think about giving me an answer in degrees. Seriously, you put your calculators away? Is that what happened? I'm hearing calculators come back out. Point nine eight radians. Good. Well, let's see. We know that zero radians is zero. We know pi over two radians is up here. Pi over two is about 1.5. This is close to one, so that's good. I mean, that answer passes the smell test. Right? It's, it smells right. Okay, so there's my, there's my phi, and I've got my magnitude. Nice. So. Yeah, this is always zero. The real axis is always zero. You with me? OK. So how do I write it in polar form? Right? I know that, I mean, I've converted it to polar. right? I know the magnitude, and I know the phase. But how do I actually write it? You put the phi, the phi into, into a less than an angle sign, so I can say M angle phi. Yeah, you can do that. That's fine. I'm cool with that. That's legit. But that's sort of like, that's from before. Now, we take to the next level. OK? So, um, so here's what we're going to do. Um, can somebody take this number and take its cosine? Point five. Let's see, is this going to work before I make myself look dumb? <coughs> yeah, OK, good. Point five five seven. Mm -hmm. OK. So in other words, you're telling me that cosine of phi is point five five seven. Now, just for kicks, please multiply that by m, root 13. Uh, 2.00. Oh, that's kind of cool. So if I take. So if I take m cos phi, oh, so basically I'm doing the backwards of this now, right? If I take cosine of phi, which is adjacent times hypotenuse, and multiply by hypotenuse, I should just get the adjacent side, which should be the real number. So basically I did this, and I got my real number back. Well, look at this. Back to Euler's equation. I'm going to put a... Uh, Put a multiplier out front. I'm going to multiply everything by m, Okay, just to make this work. So look what I have here. Here I have m cos phi. OK, well, what is this? That's m cos phi. I just demonstrated that. Because we calculated phi and took its cosine. We times it by m, and we got 2, right? So. This 2 was, in fact, equal to root 13 cosine 0.98. What do you think is going to happen when we take root 13 times sine of 0.98? Bet you nickel will get 3. Okay, So 2 plus 3j is really the same as, can basically be expressed in, um, as, instead of thinking in polar form, in rectangular form, we can also think of it in polar form. So while I'm not going to derive where this formula comes from, because it's basically magic as far as anybody can tell, um, it's not magic, but and there is a cool derivation, but I neither remember it nor would care to bore you with it if I did remember it. But essentially what, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that if you can express your, your number in rectangular form, you can also express it in polar form in a more elegant way than using the angle there's nothing wrong with saying root 13 angle 0.98. You can say that. But what I'm saying is from now on, we can say this. Root 13 e to the j 0.98. And this is effectively how I want you to think about polar form real numbers, uh, polar form complex numbers from now on. e to the j phi. It's called a complex 
exponential. There's a reason why we write complex numbers this way. One reason is that multiplying complex numbers becomes a snap, right? If you say, like, uh, 2e to the j pi over 3 times uh, 4e to the j pi over 2, how do you multiply exponentials? Right, you multiply the bits that are outside. So, in other words, 2 times 4. And then e to the j, add the phase angles. Pi over 3 plus pi over 2. Whatever that works out to, I don't really care. Okay, But that's, that's the beauty of expressing complex numbers in polar form like this. You write it as a complex exponential, everything just adds up like that. Okay, Multiplying, which we're going to be doing a lot of this semester, comes easily. Now, here's the payoff. Actually, before we do the payoff, real quick. This is in the book, but everybody should understand this. Let me just draw this on my scratch paper on the side. What number is this? One. One. If I express it in polar form, e to the j, zero. Magnitude of one, the one is implied here. Angle is zero. What's that number? One to the j pi over Well, start with, give me the number, like, just as a, in rectangular form, let's say. Zero. Right, it's j. Zero. Real part is zero. Imaginary part is one, so it's just j. So j equals e to the, e to the j <coughs> pi over two. Negative one equals e to the j pi, or e to the j, you can say e to the j pi, or e to the j minus pi. It's all good. And you can try it, right? If you don't believe me, go to your calculator and convert that into rectangular form, right? If you convert into rectangular form, you'll be taking cosine of minus pi plus j sine minus pi. What's cosine of minus pi? Minus 1. Minus one. What's sine of minus pi? Zero. Have a nice day. OK. And finally, we get this number. What's that? That's minus j. What's that going to be? Right, there's two ways you can write it. e to the j 3 pi over 2 or e to the minus j pi over 2. Probably the second one is a little easier to wrap your head around because what's the angle? Minus 90 degrees, minus pi over 2. What do you think? Commit these to memory, seriously. These need to be, we're gonna, I'm going to drop these on you when you least expect it. I want them real comfortable. Okay, we got 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, I want to do this little derivation that's going to make you miserable. Because it's going to set the stage. So remember, the name of the game, I'm just trying to motivate why I'm doing this to you. Um, the name of the game is we want to be able to express signals as sums of cosines, right? Because I came to you and I said, we're going to talk about everything in the frequency domain. And you said, cool. And then I said, if you want to think about frequencies, you've got to think about cosines. Because a cosine is like a signal that's a pure tone. It only contains one frequency. So if I could take a signal and I could break it into different cosines, then I would know how much energy there was at each frequency in that signal. So I need to take my signals and break them into cosines. That's what we're going to try to do. All right. Well, if we're going to break them into cosines, we can either work with cosines in this form, which is cool. You can do it this way. It's just more work than is necessary. So instead, we're going we're to introduce the shortcut, which is going to have the amount of work we're going to do. So uh, I've just stated that e to the j phi equals cosine phi. Oh, I said theta, didn't I? I should at least be consistent with my own baloney. 
Um, so e to the j theta, let's see, cosine theta plus j sine theta. Now, bear with me for a second. e to the minus j theta is going to equal what? Right. Technically, it's going to be cosine minus theta. But because cosine of theta is a even function, cosine of theta is the same as cosine of minus theta. So even though technically I could put minus theta here, because this is an even function, it is true that cosine of minus theta equals cosine of theta. Always. So I'm just going to write cosine of theta here. Now I'm going to have plus j sine minus theta. Is that true? Right. With sine, it works the other way. Sine of minus theta equals minus sine of theta. So my sine of minus theta becomes minus sine of theta. Guess what I'm going to do to these two functions? I'm going to add these bad boys up. OK, what's happening to the J signs? Have a nice day. It's fun having you. OK, so we're left with e to the J theta plus e to the minus J theta equals 2 cos theta. Can you live with that? You can. You. Right, and then finally, just to finish this up, turns out that cosine of theta equals 1 half e to the j theta plus 1 half e to the minus j theta. Has anyone seen this before? My lecture notes. <laughs> Good answer. Turns out you can do this again for sine. I won't rederive it for you, but it turns out you can say basically the same thing for sine. It works out a little bit differently. It's 1 over 2j e to the j phi e to the j theta minus 1 over 2j e to the minus j theta. I won't derive it, but it basically you, you solve it the same way. And basically, instead of adding these two functions together, if you subtracted them, the cosines would subtract. You'd be left with signs and then you'd, you'd get that. OK, so I've got this. This is cool. What I really want is this, right? Because that's really my, what I'm interested in. So let's see if we can make this look like that. So if it's true that cosine theta equals this, what do we think k cosine omega t plus phi? Do you think we could write that using this exponential notation? I think so. Walk me through this. So what's going to happen to this 1 half? K over 2. Right. K over 2, e to the j, is that good so far? Mm -hmm. Right. All I've done is, I mean, basically what this says is, take whatever's inside the parentheses, and chuck it up there in the exponent. Isn't that what I've done? I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. All right, and then there was the k as well. The multiplier came along for the ride. OK, so we're done with the first term. Plus k over 2, e to the j, oh, e to the minus j, omega t, plus phi. I'm happy. All right. Now, let's look at this term. I could distribute this j. OK, I could make this j omega t plus j phi. And then I could exploit, let me just come over here to my scratch paper. If I were to expand that, I would have e to the j omega t plus j phi. And is it not true by the rules of exponents that I could rewrite that as e to the j omega t times 
e to the j phi. Can I do that? Oh, we all agreed I can do that. Okay, because whenever you have two things with the same base, you just add the exponents, right? Okay, so look what I can do to this expression now. I can rewrite this as k over 2. I'm going to swap the terms a little bit. e to the j phi times e to the j omega t. Can you live with that? Right? It's all still there. There's your k over 2. Your e to the j omega t is right there. And times your e to the j phi, which is, I've just relocated it over here for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. You with me? OK. Plus k over 2 e to the minus j phi e to the j omega t. Got four minutes left. We're going to nail this. Now, something very interesting is occurring. What's that? Hmm? No? Go ahead and ask it. If, it's, if one person's wondering it, probably other people are too. Do you understand this part? Okay. On the right hand, both expressions are just this one. Okay. So I had k over 2 e to the minus j omega t plus phi. You okay with that? Okay. Can you agree that I can write that as k over 2 e to the minus j omega t minus j phi? Is that okay? I mean, that's just distributing the j, the minus j, into the expression. Okay. Can I then convince you that that's the same as k over 2 e to the minus j omega t times e to the minus j phi? That's the key part. Is that okay? Because it's always equal. Like, if I told you x squared times x cubed, you would tell me, what's that? If I multiply those, what do I get? x to the fifth. How'd you do that? It's the same base, so you just add the exponents. Well, here you go. Same base. Add the exponents, you get that. And then the last thing I did, just because I'm in a funny mood, I just swapped them. OK, now, look at what I've done. Ooh. That's fine. We got, all, we got all semester to do this. I need to be patient. OK, so let's look at this term right here. I've got k over 2 e to the j phi. That's a complex number, right? It's not a complex function. It's not a function of t. That's just a complex number. Put a box around it. I'm going to call that number complex number a. OK? So I've got a e to the j omega t. That's my first term, right? There's my a. <coughs> then I've got k over 2 e to the minus j phi. Hold on, hold on. Compare these two numbers. What are their magnitudes? Same, Same. Same magnitude. What's the relationship between their phases? Opposite. Opposite phase. There's a name for complex numbers that have the same magnitude but opposite phase. Complex conjugates. This and this are complex conjugates. OK? So remember, complex conjugates, you can think of them in one of two ways. You can either think of it as a plus jb and a minus jb, so same real part, opposite imaginary part. Or you can think of it as m e to the j theta and m e to the minus j theta. It, these are entirely equivalent, OK? Uh, same magnitudes, opposite phases. So this is stuff you should know, right? Complex numbers. But the point of the matter is, is I can take my number and write it as, we just said, a e to the j omega t plus a conjugate 
e to the minus j omega t. Why do, why do I want to bother doing this? I've halved the work, right? It's not immediately apparent why I've halved the work, but look. Before, I had two variables, right? I'll, let me just say this like 30 seconds, and then we can all go, because I've got to go too. I've got another class to teach. A moment ago, I had k and phi, magnitude and phase. I had two things to keep track of. Now what do I have to keep track of? A and A conjugate. But guess what? If you know A, you know A conjugate. Isn't that cool? If you know A, you know A conjugate. So really, I've gone from having to track a magnitude and a phase to having just to track one complex number. Now it's true that this complex number technically contains my magnitude and my phase. So I didn't really, I mean, you can't cheat the system, right? At the end of the day, I'm still tracking two variables. But I've mushed them together into one complex number. And now I only have to manipulate one complex number. So I have just have the number of formulas I have to deal with. I've made the, the whole problem a lot more elegant. This will become more apparent as we move forward. And we will, I mean, we'll come back on, I guess, Wednesday, right? Monday's off. Um, but we'll talk more about this next week, why this is useful. Okay, but essentially, we have the number of elements we need to track. So Monday's off. If you have Monday recitation, John should have contacted you by now, or he will shortly, for uh, how we're going to uh, handle recitation next week. So I'm not going to get involved with that. I'm just going to let him deal with it. Yeah, well, there is a recitation. I, I think what we're going to try to do is to send all the Monday recitation people to Wednesday's recitation. Is there going to be recitation problems for next week? Yeah, those are going to get posted later today. Okay. Right, next week's recitation problems will be posted. And there's going to be a pre-problem. You're expected to do the pre-problem before you walk into recitation. Uh, I believe you're going to have to hand it in even. Right, but the point is you can't come to recitation cold. All right, thank you.